This video is a review of the shell model that we've been developing in class based on experimental data on first ionization energies. So it might be helpful to review first ionization energy before you try um, looking at this video. And this video will serve as a review of the kinds of topics that we've been talking about in class. So first off, here's some ionization energy data right here. So in our table we have the first four at atoms of the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. Here there are atomic numbers, one, two, three, four. You'll remember that atomic number tells us the number of protons in the nucleus. And each proton, you'll recall, has a plus one charge. So Z is also telling us the positive charge that's in the nucleus. This third column is the first ionization energy. It's measured in units of megajoules per mole. So this is the amount of energy in megajoules that you would have to put in to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of these atoms. So it's a big number of energy because there's a lot of energy that you would have to do to put in for a whole mole of these atoms. So for hydrogen that number is 1.312 megajoules per mole. The other piece of information that we need to use in thinking about the shell model has to do with the forces of attraction between charged particles. And that's governed by Coulomb's law. So sometimes it's called Coulombic attraction. Also, it goes by the name electrostatic attraction because it's the force between charged particles when they're stationary. So the electro part has to do with charges and the static because they're stationary. So potential energy here, this equation down here, is potential energy equals K. K is a positive constant. Q1 is the charge on one particle. Q2 is the charge on a second particle. Now it doesn't matter what particle you call one and what particle you call two. And what we think of as particles can be different things. It could be an electron and a nucleus. It could be an electron and another electron. It could be an electron and the core of an atom. It could be two ions that are maybe interacting. Lastly, we divide this by the distance that separates those two charges. So when you put all this together, you can calculate the potential energy. And we're not going to do very many calculations with this. Really what we want to think about is how the energy changes as we change things like charge or distance. And so this equation helps us think about that. So our, our model for hydrogen, we're going to pattern it off of Bohr's model for the uh, hydrogen atom. Here in the center is the plus one nuclear charge. Now I've drawn it this way, it looks really big. So remember that um, the nucleus of an atom is really tiny compared to the whole atom. Then we have an orbit that kind of goes around this nucleus. And instead of thinking it, of it like an orbit, like a ring, we're going to imagine that it is a shell. So this electron could be anywhere on the surface of a sphere. This electron is a little red dot here. Remember that it has a minus one charge. We're going to call this the n equal one shell. So n is just a number, and we're going to give it a shell number. So this is shell number one. So now we're going to look at helium. What we see is it takes about twice as much energy to take an electron off of a helium atom. So why might that be? Well, if we look at this potential energy formula here, and we think about what's going on with the charges and the distances, well, Q1 might be the charge on the electron, so that's minus one. In the hydrogen atom, Q2 would be the charge on the nucleus, plus one. In helium, the charge on the nucleus has changed. It's now plus two. So if we have plus, uh, minus one times plus two, we're going to get a negative two. So that's about twice as much potential energy, and that could account for this approximately doubling the ionization energy. So that's consistent with putting the electron about the same distance d from the nucleus. So we're going to put that second electron in the same shell. So our picture might look like this. Last is our picture for lithium. Lithium has three protons in the nucleus, plus three. And what we see about the ionization energy for lithium is that it's gone way down. So it's now 0.52. So that's really, a, really much lower than what we were seeing before. So following our pattern, we're going to keep these two electrons, um, the first two electrons, in this first shell. So what all has changed? Well, the nuclear charge has gone up to plus three. If we were to put the third electron in that same shell, that same distance from the nucleus, what would change? The d would be the same, q1 would be the same, because it's minus one, but q2 would change to plus three. And so we would expect an ionization energy about three times that of hydrogen. And it's not. It's way less. So how can we make it less? We can make it less by taking this electron and putting it further away from the nucleus of the atom. So we can increase d. So q2 can still be plus 3. And then we can increase d. And that might give us a consistent picture. 
So we have to put that electron in a shell that is now much further away from the nucleus. So this means that our atom has also grown. So this atom is now a bigger atom, so lithium is a bigger atom than hydrogen because it has more shells. And again, we'll call this the second shell, the n equal 2 shell. Now in reality, this outer electron right here, and by the way, we call these outer electrons, they have a name. We call this outer shell the valence shell. So every atom has an outer shell, so every atom has a valence shell. Any electrons that are in that valence shell are called valence electrons. So lithium only has one valence electron. So there's a valence electron. And for lithium, um, there's just one of them, right? One valence electron. So this n equal 1 shell that's still down here is not a valence shell, so we call it an inner shell. Now not every atom has an inner shell. For example, hydrogen and helium have no inner shells. Um, many atoms will have multiple inner shells, so there may be more than one inner shell. Now what we know about electrons, like this guy right here, is that they are repelled by other electrons. So these two electrons that are on this inner shell are going to be exerting repulsive forces. So I'll draw that as a double-headed arrow as though it's pushing that electron away. So that's going to make this electron a little bit easier to take off. So effectively what these other electrons are doing is decreasing the attraction of this electron for the nucleus because they are pushing, trying to push it away. So we can account for that in an approximate way by simply decreasing the charge, the positive charge that this electron is interacting with. So rather than having to write down separate terms for all these repulsions, we're going to say that, okay, the middle part of this atom, we are going to replace it with an effective nuclear charge. So I'm going to draw a little line here. This little dash circle that I draw, drew is trying to encompass what we call the effective. And since normal nuclear charge is given the symbol Z, we're going to sometimes call this Z with a little subscript EFF for effective. So that's Z effective, the effective nuclear charge. And we're going to approximate the effective nuclear charge by something that we're going to call core charge. So core charge is the charge, the net charge of the core. So we want to figure out what is the total net charge of the nucleus plus any of the inner shell electrons. Not any, all of the inner shell electrons. So the nucleus here in um, lithium has a plus 3 charge. It's going to be the nuclear charge. And for lithium, that would be plus 3. And then what we're going to do is subtract from that the number of inner shell electrons that we have. Each inner shell electron, remember, has a charge of minus 1. So we've got plus 3, minus 1 for this electron, minus 1 for this electron. That gives us an overall charge of plus 1. So core charge is the nuclear charge minus the number of inner shell electrons. And you need to count all of the inner shells. So if there's more than one inner shell, you need to count all of the electrons on all of the inner shells. And so that gives us a core charge of plus 1. So notice there's a little bit of an interesting uh, pattern here, an interesting coincidence right now. The number of valence electrons that lithium has is equal to the core charge. And so that turns out to be generally true, that the number of valence electrons equals the core charge. So let's go on and apply this same model to beryllium and um, see what we get. So beryllium, has, so beryllium has four protons in the nucleus, so that gives it a plus four charge. So I'm going to draw a plus four with a circle around it. And then we've got our shells. We have the n equal one shell, the first shell. There it is, and we're going to have two electrons on that shell. One, two. And then we've got our second shell here. All right now, in thinking about where to put this next electron, we have to consider um, what's happened to the ionization energy. So we've gone from 0.5 to 0.899, so the ionization energy has gone up. Well, that's consistent with putting the electrons in the same distance from the nucleus and just letting the charge on the nucleus increase. So now we've got two electrons that are in the same shell, the n equal 2 shell. So this electron right here will now be a little bit harder to remove because it sees a bigger charge. Now let's think about the core charge here. So I'm going to draw a little dashed line around the core. So we've got one inner shell, well, a set of electrons, so two inner shell electrons. So right now the nuclear charge is plus four, but that gets offset by this one minus one charge from that electron and another minus one charge from that electron. So that gives us a core charge of plus two. So we've got plus two, which is also equal to the number of valence electrons that we have, one, two valence electrons. And we can continue this idea if we have more ionization energy data as we continue working our way across the row of the periodic table that has beryllium in it. So the second row of the periodic table, 
we will discover that ionization energy generally increases. There's some little blips, but generally increases. And so that would be consistent with continuing to add electrons to this n equal 2 shell until we get to neon. And so once we get to neon, then we look at the atomic number for neon, which is 10. And so that tells us that we've got a plus 10 charge in the nucleus got the first shell, and then I told you that it's consistent with continuing to add electrons to the second shell. So we're going to put two electrons in the first shell, one, two, and then a neutral neon atom will have the same number of electrons as protons, so we've got eight more electrons to put in this outer shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, now again we can calculate, we've got eight valence electrons, right? Eight valence electrons. And we've also got a core charge of plus eight because it's plus 10 minus two. So the core charge, which I'll abbreviate CC, is equal to plus eight. So if we think about what's happening here, as we move across the periodic table from lithium to neon, ionization energy increases. So why does that happen? Well, in lithium, we've got one valence electron attracted to a core charge of plus one. So if we think about Coulomb's law formula, we've got a negative one times a plus one. Right? Now we're going to compare that to beryllium. So here's beryllium down here. So beryllium has two valence electrons, but they're attracted to, but one of these valence electrons would be attracted to a plus two core charge, right? So we would replace up here in the formula this, uh, we would replace the plus one core charge with plus two. And so that increases the ionization energy. And then as we work our way across to neon, the core charge, or the effective nuclear charge, has continued to increase. So now we're up to plus eight. So now the electrons that are in neon that you might try to remove, rip one of those guys off, take it off the atom, well, it's being attracted to a core charge of plus eight, which exerts a much stronger pull on that electron. So it takes much more energy to remove that electron. So that's where we stand with the um, shell model picture. It turns out that the shell model picture of electronic structure has a lot to say about why the periodic table has the shape that it does. And that's really cool because the periodic table has the shape that it does because Mendeleev and others saw a whole bunch of patterns in experimental data. So it was nature that told us the periodic table has the particular shape that it does. But now we have a model that kind of follows some of the patterns of that shape. So let's think about what I mean by that. Let's look at a picture of the periodic table. So the columns, the groups of the periodic table, we know that elements in a group have similar kinds of properties. They're related, different from each other, but related. And we also know that the groups have numbers. So we're gonna focus on the main group elements. They're the ones with the A beside them. So the first two columns and then the last six columns. So it turns out that these Roman numerals that are here at the top, so like Roman numeral 1a, 2a, and so on, but those turn out to be important. So what do we know about hydrogen and lithium um, in terms of the number of valence electrons and their core charge? Well, what we know is that number of valence electrons and core charge are all plus one. So there's one valence electron and a core charge of plus one. So in group two, we've already seen that beryllium has a core charge of plus two, and it has two valence electrons. So two valence electrons and a core charge of plus two. And we're gonna skip over the transition metals and the rare earth elements down here and move over to group 3A. So Roman numeral three is telling you that you have three valence electrons and a core charge of plus three, and so on. So four valence electrons, five valence electrons, six valence electrons, seven valence electrons, eight valence electrons. And then when you come to neon, the next element is gonna be sodium. So sodium, what happens is we'll see that the ionization energy is much lower. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that we have to add a new shell. So the rows of the periodic table, and they're called periods, the row number corresponds to shell number. So the end that I've been talking about. So with hydrogen and helium, we're putting electrons in the n equal one shell. Lithium puts electrons in the n equal two shell. And so does beryllium, boron, and so on through to neon. Once we get down to sodium, we start adding things to the n equal three shell. So we could figure out then, say if we had a cesium atom, that it's gonna have a core charge of plus one, it's gonna have one valence electron, and that one valence electron is gonna be in the sixth shell. So there's a pattern here that relates 
the periodic table to the structure of the atom and where we place those electrons. And so these will be very helpful to us, little helpful clues in the future for helping us figure out the number of valence electrons that an atom has because it's going to use, an atom will use those valence electrons when it tries to bond with other atoms to make uh, chemical compounds. And we'll find it very helpful to think about the valence electrons and count the number of valence electrons that each atom contributes when they're bonding together.